So you're thinking about getting married. Congratulations. It is amazingly exciting. What a milestone in your life and your partner's life. And I wanted to give you just a little bit of advice from a guy with 14 years of marriage under his belt from two different wives. Here's the thing. When you get married, you're making this commitment that's public, that is showing uh, both your love to the person you're with, but also to the broader community. And I know that when I got married the first time, I was in my early 20s, my thought was that this was going to be the natural development of life. Like it's just something that you do. You know, it's like one of those goalposts that you hit. And if you did it right, uh, you were going to like have a great successful life because that was the path that um, we all go on. And I think there's a sort of like level of romanticism that we have naturally as, you know, humans of the earth who love things uh, that make us not quite think so rationally about marriage. So I was going to give you just some very, very subjective advice from my own experience that I think is really useful for anyone contemplating this next stage. And I think it's going to be useful. When my father heard that I was getting married the first time, one of the things he did, he said, Scott, you should really get some counseling before you get married with your wife, with your future wife, in order to sort of understand, um, you know, what this commitment means and what you're doing. And I was like, forget it, dad. I know love. You guys don't know anything about this. And, um, and I just totally ignored the, su the suggestion. And while I don't think that everyone needs counseling, I think that's mm, possibly a little excessive. There is a great book that you and your future partner really, really should uh, examine and buy right now. It's called The Hard Questions, and I'm going to link to it down in the, the place down below. And what it has are a hundred questions that every couple who's thinking about getting married should talk about. Because here's the thing with falling in love is that it, it sort of makes you crazy, right? It sort of makes you think that, you know, you get that initial uh, oxytocin blast and everything feels fluffy and fuzzy and wonderful. And certainly when you, you know, actually ask someone to marry you, there's another sort of big blast of this. And sometimes you don't think about what your mutual vision for what marriage is really about. So, um, for instance, how are you going to split your finances? Do you both want kids? Do you have a philosophy of how you want to have pets? Do you have goals for building a house or retirement or, or vacations? Or do you want to focus on your career? There's a lot of questions that um, we just sort of assume the other person is on board with, and they may not be. Um, for instance, uh, what are you going to do when your parents both get older? How are you going to split time helping them out? All of these questions sort of are, are things that we often don't want to ask ourselves, let alone a partner, but they, it really, really helps. And when I um, bought this book and talked it over with my, my wife, um, it really, really helped set the stage and really made us feel a lot closer. So buy that book, The Hard Questions and just share it with your future partner. Here's the th thing that's great about it. If there's an awkward question that you don't want to, you feel uncomfortable asking yourself, it's probably in the book. And that's a very neutral way to uh, suggest, hey, maybe we think about this thing. Um, because the book asked it. It wasn't, it wasn't me, but it was the book. And that really opens the door to having some really productive discussions and, and sets expectations for what marriage can be about. Another book that I think that you really, really should go and purchase right now is Committed by Elizabeth Gilbert. Elizabeth Gilbert's the woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And she really talks about the history of marriage, like how we got from, uh, you know, the, the, the first moments where you're like, let's bond mutually for the, our whole lives. And it turns out that the, the very concept of marriage is not about this idea of romantic and eternal love. It's about property rights, right? And, and who, who controls property? Who passes it down to descendants? 
and who owns women like men own women in like the initial uh, way that marriage got um, formed and it is a wonderful and riveting exploration of this enormous commitment that you're going to make and she's a really really good writer uh, and here's the thing here's my big takeaway from from that book is that don't make the state define what your union means like when you sign that legal document there are sort of like assumptions made by legislators and governors to define exactly what this means in terms of health care in terms of tax breaks and the tax breaks are you know honestly they're pretty good but it 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 sort of demystifies the process of how they got there. And then she says something which is totally counterintuitive to anybody who's like contemplating marriage right now. And she says that prenups are like the most romantic thing that a couple can do um, before marriage. And because what it's doing, what a prenup is, it's a sort of a, a legal document or more really it's like a, just an agreement to talk about what that marriage between the two partners actually looks like. And yes, I know it sort of does assume that, you know, things could end with your with your blissful union, but in a way that's really really responsible because when you're contemplating marriage, you are going in with the most possible optimism. Both partners are in love, right? They they want to create a mutual bond that lasts forever. But, you know, we all know that like in the United States, it's between 30 and 50% of marriages end. So why not? Before you get into a marriage, you can talk about the very real fact that marriages can end and, and, that, and that you can negotiate what sort of that ending might look like. Doesn't mean you're going to do it, but you can negotiate sort of what that might look like in a way that's reasonable and fair to both people and there you know the reason why it's romantic is because it gets those assumptions out of the way like let's say for instance you want to have kids and uh you know in most american marriages the woman is spending most of the time raising kids and the man is making the money um what does that mean for you know the time that that someone is sacrificing to have kids and and if you were going to leave what would what would be a fair way to do that or let's say one of you has a lot of property right now and you know your marriage you know and then one partner discovers they're gay four years in not one's fault just they i was gay i'm sorry um how do you want to deal with things that already exist in my prenup um, with my with my wife Laura, which we negotiated, and we have a signed thing and everything. Um, it's very clear that she gets her 1996 uh, Honda Civic, and I get my Hyundai Sonata. Neither of which we own anymore. And it, it you know, uh, was eight years on. Uh, the prenup is not really all that important uh, to where our lives have come, but it did sort of describe how you can um, at least think about things. Like, does one of you have retirement? Well, what if you get divorced in three years? Does the person get half the retirement? Just talk it out because there are going to be things that you don't know uh, about how your life will develop. And why not make it all clear? Because this is, you know, super important. When I got married the first time, I was certain that my marriage would not end. And I think that we both held on to that assumption that the commitment alone would keep us together. And, and, and there was all the shame and divorce and, and whatnot. And I think because we assumed that the shame would keep us together, it actually made our marriage much worse. We would actually have felt secure-er, more secure, if we had known uh, going into it like, no marriages can end and we have to work on it and we have to work on it, like assumptions of reality versus some sort of fantasy notion of what marriage is supposed to mean. And, and having, um, I think that with, with the woman I'm married to now, Laura, who is wonderful, I think the fact that we have both gone into this as um, having gone through marriages um, previously, I think knowing that it can end actually makes it way, way more likely that we are going to stay together. So 
that's why, weirdly why I think the prenups are so damned romantic and why Elizabeth Gilbert thinks that they're so damned romantic is that they let you look at marriage as the institution that it is and you get a clear idea of what you're getting into and you're not letting the state define what it is your marriage is supposed to look like. Um, one other thing, and this is a little bit more minor, but it can actually be a big issue, is that there was a, a study that came out a few years ago which said that the more a couple spends on their wedding correlates with a higher likelihood of divorce. Now, you've probably been to some weddings, right? Have you ever noticed how the bride and the mother-in-law and the, the, the bridesmaids and everyone is frazzled and they're spending just gobs and gobs of money on just the perfect beach setting or destination wedding or whatever it is? That all that stress is actually a terrible way to start um, a union, right? One, you're starting off in debt or somebody is spending a ton of money to get in your debt and, and that doesn't go anywhere. That doesn't go to set up a nest egg. That doesn't go up to have a great honeymoon. It, that, that just goes to some wedding planners and some event planning and some food that's way overpriced. And, and, that, and starting off your whole marriage with that amount of pressure is uh, not auspicious and it does correlate with higher levels of divorce. So I would suggest, and you know, a lot of people say it's not possible. I have to have a big wedding and you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. But I would say consider eloping. Uh, when I got, my, my first wedding was enormous. Second wedding, and all second weddings should definitely be <laughs> eloping. Um, but what we did is all the money that we would have spent on um, the marriage ceremony or whatever, we put into a kitty and we went to um, Colombia and we just said vows to each other on the beach, which were very sort of intentional. And it was just the two of us and, it, it, and two Weimariners who actually crashed our wedding and stole, <laughs> stole her shoes um, at the ceremony. Um, anyway, story, I'll <laughs> include a picture. Um, by doing that, um, we're starting with as low pressure as possible. Uh, and then, you know, since families definitely have to meet and it's great that they are able to meet, we, we threw a post elopement taco party where we got a taco truck to come cater a wedding. And it, uh, there was like no pressure. I didn't want gifts. I didn't want anything. I just said, everyone who wants to come, it's gonna be like a backyard barbecue and, and there was a pinata. And, and by lowering the stakes, everyone had a lot, uh, had a greater time. Like there was no arguing over who was best man or bridesmaid one or you know any of that stuff. It was just like a celebration. And I think that that is a awesome thing. So um, yeah, that's my advice on what I really hope that you consider. Get those books, consider eloping. Um, do a prenup, a romantic, romantic prenup. And, uh, and now I think probably a video I have to do in the future is uh, why I got divorced and how come it took me so long to do it and, uh, and some methods to make that process better. That's not gonna be as fun of a video. Um, but anyway, congratulations uh, and you know, like, subscribe, I'll put some info down there. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for watching.